Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. Those of you that are joining us here uh, on um, uh, live stream as well, Israeli News Live on live stream, and those of you that will be joining us a little bit later here on YouTube, uh, we had uh, had a little technical issue putting it together here for live stream because our equipment was updating, so a little run behind on that. Uh, and by the way, keep in mind, uh, in the next couple of weeks there, we will be in Israel. We will be carrying a lot of broadcasts on live stream there in Israel, especially when we're in the uh, on the Syrian border there, trying to catch the things that are happening over there with Russia and the, uh, the air support that they are offering for Bashar al-Assad and their forces there. Uh, and you know, it's interesting tonight as I was getting ready for the news, of course, we had breaking news earlier today. There was a uh, terrorist attack in Jerusalem where a uh, man had uh, came through and he had he actually stabbed a man in his shoulders. It was not a critical wound, but uh, he uh, moderate injuries, as has been reported by Israel National News there. Uh, but the police did catch this man. But in light of that, I begin to get ready for tonight's broadcast on what we were going to do our news on. And I stumbled across something, uh, and, and it's actually, we're going to be getting into a scriptural look at this as well. Uh, but the title of our broadcast on YouTube, War is Just Good Business in a Sick Way. Uh, on our live stream, we kind of re we test or did this a little differently altogether. We have it on live stream as Obama wins Salesman of the Year. You will see in a few moments of why uh, we have it that titled that way there. Anyway, let's go right into the broadcast here tonight. Are, are Obama's records arms sales to Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Egypt, and Iraq fueling unrest in the Middle East? Uh, this was an article on April the 7th of 2015. Uh, and before I go into this article here, let me kind of give you guys an idea of why I came to this particular uh, particular news broadcast tonight anyway. Uh, RT was running a uh, program just earlier, about two hours ago, there on an interview, and I wished I'd gotten the man's name that they were interviewing. He was a whistleblower in the United States. Uh, and I don't know if he was former CIA or what he was, but he actually had uncovered uh, a lot of information how that the U.S. government uh, fuels the conflicts. Nothing really new. We've known this from different whistleblowers, by the way, over the years. But he, but he was speaking about how that the U.S. fuels conflicts on both sides uh, of, of, of the table, so to speak. In other words, they were the ones arming the Iraqis as well as the Iranians to fight one another. And the sad thing was, was in the interview, the man goes into how that now they are recruiting ch children to fight the battles there from Africa, uh, part of, I think, the Yemen uh, crisis that is going on. And this whistleblower was showing how the United States government is very much involved in uh, these types of activities. Not that the U.S. is involved in, uh, I would say, bringing in child uh, warriors, but I think the point was is that the U.S. government is very much plays both sides of uh, the fence with the enemies in order to be able to do weapon sales. And this is the main purpose of the whistleblowing there. Uh, and again, that's been done time and time again before. Uh, but there's actually a prophecy that a lot of people overlook and I've even overlooked it before, that speaks of this in an indirect way, or maybe even a direct way. So this is what led me to go back and say, wait a minute, what is really going on then? I mean, we're having all these wars, we see the conflict, we see the unrest. Is it just business as usual? Is everyone dying out here because of the money for the, for the wars, or do the people really just hate each other that bad? Well, it may surprise you. We didn't do a deep investigative report on this. It's kind of a, a, mi a miniature one there. I uh, wish I'd have devoted more time to it, but I know there's a lot of resources already out there online. You can find yourself as well just to see how deep this rabbit hole really goes. Uh, anyway, in this article here on April the 7th of 2015, Obama... Uh, uh, are Obama's records arms sales to Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Egypt, and Iraq fueling unrest in the Middle East? Well, really, they need the unrest in order to get the sales is what it comes out to be. It's not that the sales are fueling it. It is the fact they need the unrest to get the sales to make the money. 
Perhaps this is maybe one way they help pay off the national debt. I think not. Anyway, the picture that was uh, found on a different article is kind of interesting. Uh, most prolific Middle East arms dealer since World War II. Anyway, the article states here, as Saudi Arabia continues U.S.-backed strikes in Yemen and Washington lifts its freeze on military aid to Egypt, new figures show President Obama has overseen a major increase in weapons sales since taking office. The majority of weapons exports under Obama have gone to the Middle East and Persian Gulf and Saudi Arabia tops the list at $46 billion in new agreements. We are joined by William Hartung, who says that even after adjusting for inflation, the volume of major deals concluded by Obama administration is the first five years exceeds the amount approved uh, by Bush administration in its full eight years uh, in office by, the, by nearly $30 billion. Now get this, in the yellow here at the bottom of your screen, that also means that the Obama administration has approved more arms sales than any U.S. administration since World War II. I mean, guys, this is staggering to think that really what's going on is not to make the world safer, it's to make more money. And I had kind of been wondering this, especially as I'd even watch uh, President Putin doing the same thing. As soon as the, uh, the, the, the embargoes had been lifted on Iraq, Putin was quick to get in those S-300 sales while he could get that money in there and get this thing going. And now he's working on a deal with India and even China. I mean, Putin is another big salesman of military hardware. And it's interesting the tactics they use to see which one can sell more. Well, Obama happens to be the winner, hands down. He even beat Vladimir Putin in arms deals around the world. You're going to see that in a few moments. Now, it's another thing that I've noticed as well. These world leaders, although Russia and the United States are the two major world powers when it comes to military equipment, hardware, etc. Forget the idea of NATO. The, the whole reason why they make an alliance there like NATO besides bringing in a new world order and to control the world under the papacy, but it's also in order to be able to do more arms deals and arms deals between each other and to make everybody feel unsafe or unsecure, make Russia look like a villain so that all of the Eastern Europeans will rush to buy weapons with their little bit of money that they have. And yet, when it comes to Turkey, the reason why the United States turns a blind eye on Turkey is because they need Turkey to make some money from the ISIS oil market in order to be able to sell him some more weapons. Why? Because they let Erdogan make, let him think of himself that he's going to be a dictator, a world leader, that he's going to rise to the top. And any kind of world leader is going to definitely need some weapons to support that to go, to, to, to go along with his world conquering ambitions. No doubt. No wonder why they let him go in there and slip into Syria and Iraq as well and bomb and kill a bunch of people and sell some more bullets, some more hardware, some more guns, more ammos. It's just business, isn't it? It's a sick business is what it is. Very sick. No wonder why God said there'll be nothing like that in his kingdom. There'll be no death. There'll be no dying, no bloodshed whatsoever. And that's both man and beast, by the way. Anyway, let's move right along. Putin, Russia's problem isn't Clinton or Trump. It's America's imperial ambitions. You know, President Putin, and it's true, there is an imperialistic ambition, but I think even if President Putin would step back and look at this as well from a fair point of view, it's not so much imperialism that the United States wants. The United States just wants to make sure they keep making money off all these arms sales and all these arm deals. It's just like John Kerry is really big into what happens for the Palestinian people in the West Bank because his wife has a lot of money invested in the West Bank. So a two-state solution is imperative, just like the oil deals and things of that nature as well. It's not just about weapons, but it's about oil to be able to run the world's economies, to be able to have have money to buy all these weapons. Of course, that goes in with it as well. This was on Vice News April of 2016. 
Putin uh, made that statement, Russia's problem isn't Clinton or Trump, it's America's imperial ambitions. Now, he said this many times already here recently. In fact, he stated that the United States is not taking in Russia's own strategic interest in what it's doing around the globe. And he's right. They've just been gobbling up all the business, gobbling up all the oil and making sure the Pope gets Jerusalem all along. Don't forget, that's what the Pope wants out of this. They want to make sure that Israel is divided, there's a two states, and that, guess what, the Vatican will get Jerusalem. It's one reason why we keep seeing Jerusalem slip from the hands of the Israeli government and going into the hands of the Palestinians, because the Palestinians will gladly tell the Pope, you can, have the king, uh, you can have the king's seat right there at King David's tomb. You can have all of it. In fact, it's probably not far from there where they'll end up building a third temple. I've always thought it would be beside the Dome of the Rock, and I still hold that still a very good possibility. Let's don't give up on that idea as of yet, but I'm very concerned about the things that are going on in the background. And from Israel, we'll be telling you more about that and showing you exactly what I mean by those people like Chuck Missler and, and Bob Kranuk, uh, who have been promoting the idea that the temple was all along in the wrong place. Now, yay or nay, I've had different opinions on that myself, uh, but it's not so much that. I believe it's a Vatican plot to make sure that they use their land to build the third temple in order to be able to have more control over it. Anyway, Putin said here, um, Another question, or it says here in the article, another question he partially deflected was, who would be better for Russia, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton? As U.S. President, Putin said, strained relations were due not to individual politicians, but rather a belief America was exceptional. Warning that the United States should set aside imperial ambitions and act respectfully toward all its partners, including Russia. He also said it was too early to answer a question about whether he'd run for his fourth term in 2018. Again, it is a sales tactic. You have to make the enemy look bad. And if he makes America look like an imperialistic nation, which really, in this case here, he's not even making the president or, or the runners look like uh, imperialist here. He's making the American people now look like they have imperialistic ambitions. And quite frankly, I don't think the, any of the United States Americans really care about the imperial amb ambitions. The U.S. people have never cared or wanted the Middle East or anything about it. In fact, all they wanted to do is live in peace in their own land and just have a decent economy with a plenty of oil in order to run our big trucks. Um, I don't have one, but I'm just saying there. So anyway, uh, so let's move on. Let's look at the biblical prophecy behind this, though. When I say a prophecy or something that Yeshua, Jesus himself, said about this that really has always kind of stumped me, but now I think I understand why. Matthew 24, verse 6, And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. You know, when Jesus said that you're going to hear of wars, those are the actual fightings and rumors of wars. In other words, the big one's going to come. Then he would say, see that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And everybody is, we're quick to rush to Ezekiel 38, to Armageddon, all these different type of wars that are supposed to be the very last thing that's supposed to end everything. And so for me, it's always been like when we hear about the wars, I'm thinking of, well, it's the total annihilation. It's the, the, this is it. This is the time. But then that used to always kind of trouble me. Then why would Jesus say in Matthew 24, verse, verse 6, see that you be not troubled? Do you think perhaps that maybe, just maybe, Jesus, Yeshua himself, realized or knew, because he is God, let's face it, he knew everything that ever would be, that even though he does know there's physical wars being fought, but he knows that it's more so as a sales gimmick. That he knows that most of these wars are only started in order to be able to sell weapons. In other words, don't trouble yourself about it. It's just a stupid, evil, wicked game the world leaders play. At the expense of a lot of people, though. There's no doubt about that. But he said, see that you be not troubled. Because see, Yeshua knows there's a greater trouble coming. And we'll get into that in a moment. All right, let's move along here. So we go back into this again. Lavrov, there are grounds to say Turkey benefits from oil business with terrorists. 
again. Uh, and, and this was actually an article that just came out today on TASS News. I forgot to put the date up there, but it came out today, May 16th. He said, Turkey and terrorists had an oil business and business of contraband and, and artifacts and other illegal uh, movements across the border. The Turkish leadership was turn, turning a blind eye on. Moreover, the Turkish leadership was linking its pockets with this, or excuse me, lining its pockets with this business, uh, he said. That's uh, uh, Lavrov. The minister added that the Islamic State, ISIS, terrorist organization banned in Russia gets support from countries neighboring Syria and Iraq. Hmm. That's interesting, isn't it? Gets support from those countries. In other words, Turkey and Saudi Arabia is what he is speaking about. And there again, why is the blind eye turned? Well, they've got to be able to make money to be able to buy the weapons. And I said this in several broadcasts already, but never thinking about this, that this is nothing but a business to make money and to create the conflict in order to make more money. But then again, you have to remember, there is, of course, one little key thing that is always consistent, and that is whatever the papacy wants to conquer, they're definitely going to fight that war. And Jerusalem is the main one. And it doesn't matter what it takes, the Pope of Rome isn't going to go down without making sure that Jerusalem is handed over to him. That is why you see Jean Theron in the article that was published back in 2011 by Giulio Miotti that stated in there, there will be no peace in Jerusalem until the holy sites are dealt with. The security of those are handed over into a, a, basically a third party and given over to the Vatican a United Nations force. That's the ultimate goal as well, to put a United Nations force in Israel. By the way, the Lord dealt with me on something about that. I'll have to share that with you a little bit later there, but there are some very interesting things, and perhaps from Israel we'll get into more of these things. Five NATO weapons of war. Russia should fear the national interest. This, this is a news article, just a regular news article, right? But wait a minute, the U.S. is only one member of NATO, and it happens to be one of the members that isn't even on the European continent, should NATO and Russia come to blows, it's certain that European forces will go into battle alongside perhaps American troops. If this scenario happens, here are five NATO weapons Russia should fear. Then they give you their list of five. Their weapons they should fear. Five. In other words, we're trying to tell you what you should go buy because Russia's the big bad bear and they're going to come over here and, and beat everybody up. Now the thing is though, is these types of scenarios could cause war as well. But it's good for business. That's another reason why there's such a big thing about Kim Jong-un. You know, could he really successfully get a nuke and hit the United States? Perhaps on the very outside, maybe there is, but I guarantee you one thing is good for business for Kim Jong-un to do what he does. That's why they don't just go in there and blow him all up. The only time they're going to go in there and blow everything up that he's got is when they want to make money by selling more weapons. You know, so it's a, it's a, it's a very, it's a tightrope that they have to walk, uh, walk there. Now, J.W. Smith, uh, I, uh, I don't know the man. I've not read his book. I just saw these comments about, uh, about his book here and the things that he states in here under, and it was on the uh, website, uh, Global Issues, June 21st of 2003, Military Propaganda for Armed Sales. Uh, but I thought it was interesting, so uh, I'm not here so much to en endorse the book, but if you want to get it, it's up to you, no big deal. But anyway, it says, the armament uh, firms uh, have been active in forming war scares and in persuading their countries to adopt warlike policies and to increase their armaments. But I, th I think these points are very valid in this article, is my point. That armament firms have attempted to bribe government officials both at home and abroad. That armament firms have dis, uh, dissemi, disseminate, excuse me, disseminated false reports concerning the military and naval programs of various countries in order to stimulate armament expenditures. That armament firms have sought to influence public opinion through the control of newspapers in their own and foreign countries. That armament firms have organized international armament rings through which uh, the armament race has been uh, 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 accentuated, excuse me, accentuated by playing off one country against another. Now that's 
We see that all the time, guys. That armament firms have organized international armament trusts, which have increased the, uh, the price of armament sold to governments. Sure they have. I mean, is, this is the, the, the craziest thing you could ever imagine. And, and I know probably many of you guys, it's like you already know this. It's not like anything new to you. I mean, it's been obvious to me, but you know, I, I, when I look at the different scenarios that are happening in the world today, and the wars, literally, I mean, this is not, this is not just a rumor of a war either, and that's, God knows my heart, I know that rumor of the war, I believe, is the war between the United States and uh, Russia. I think that's where the rumor of the war is, because Jesus clearly says kingdom would rise against kingdom and nation against nation, but I believe that's smaller nations, like we've seen with North and South Korea, uh, the, uh, that's, you're dealing with civil wars, but then you have kingdom against kingdom, the Turkish against the Saudis, or, or excuse me, Turks against the uh, 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 Syria. You have uh, uh, Erdogan, you know, er Erdogan going into Syria and attacking them. The Saudis wanting to come in against them. Saudis against Yemen right now. There again, kingdom against kingdom. Uh, Iraq and Iran, for example, again, two kingdoms fighting against one another, or you could say nations. But nonetheless, it's happening on a regular basis, and the prophecies that we see Jesus say has, has been being fulfilled all along. And now we have ISIS, the internal struggle that they're using all over the globe, and both nations are benefiting from the horror of a bunch of mercenaries, paid thugs, and even President Putin had said they are mercenaries, and he said the United States was the one that actually brought them into to place. Now we have new breaking news that has come out where, uh, what have they agreed to do? Now they're going to sell, sell arms to, to, the, to, the, uh, uh, to Lebanon. Uh, because why? ISIS is such a terrible threat. You know, the United States can go in there and take out ISIS at any time they so desire to and be done with it. Just like Russia has done in Syria. And let me tell you something. Russia put ISIS down, and the main reason they put them down was because it was affecting their oil deal that they had with Bashar al-Assad, and they could not have Bashar al-Assad going out of the business there. This is why Russia was there. Not to mention it was a great way to be able to sell more weapons for Russia too because they got to showcase what they had and just how successful they were in doing what they did. That's just made the United States more nervous. Another uh, very interesting article here, the, wor the world in terms of Russia and the U.S. arms exports. As crisis balloons around the world, Russia and the U.S. increasingly find themselves at odds. Tensions between the two countries have reached levels not since, seen since the Cold War, and experts have warned that Putin is involved in an existential struggle against the West. Another threat. Against this backdrop, the nations around the world find themselves increasingly divided over where they purchase their arms and whose orbit they are in. According to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, the U.S. sold $10.2 billion worth of equipment worldwide compared to Russia's $5.9 billion in 2014. That's why we know that Obama is, hands down, number one arms dealer in the world. Um, and this chart, this graph here, I don't know how well you guys can see it, probably on live streams, even worse for you guys. Uh, but this is an amazing chart right here. It just shows you the countries that, they, that the two uh, actually have as those that are buying their weapons from them. Uh, the United States, of course, having the, the biggest uh, uh, people that buy weapons from them. Uh, Turkey is a big, big buyer. Saudi Arabia. Turkey, by the way, that's why I say Erdogan is a rising superstar for the United States. They want this man to look great, not to mention the Vatican needs another, they need an Antichrist decoy to get the monkey off their back, so to speak. So the Vatican loves it. The Vatican loves it as well. This was uh, the whole thing to begin with, is to have uh, the Christians look somewhere else for the Antichrist. Well, Erdogan's a good pick for that, and they got everybody's distracted with Erdogan, and Erdogan's ambitions are just going to rake in the dough. Wonder how much money the Vatican owns in some of these companies. I have to do a little research on that. Taiwan, believe it or not, is a big buyer of weapons uh, from the United States. Um, uh, we also have Singapore, China, that is, Kuwait, UA, United Arab Emirates, Oman, Japan, South Korea, Australia, United Kingdom. 
All these countries are, are, are big, but the biggest ones are Taiwan, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia. Why does Taiwan buy so much weapons? Because of the conflict with China. And let me tell you something. You don't think that the United States doesn't run their little warships in there? Well, we got big warships, not little, but you know what I mean. They don't run their warships up in there just to build that tension with China. And then Taiwan's over there like, oh my God, oh my God, let's buy some more, buy some more, buy some more. This is exactly what's happening. No wonder Jesus says, don't be troubled over it, you know? See that you be not troubled. It's nothing but a moneymaker. Russia, they're top people. Believe it or not, Vietnam is their number one buyer of weapons. China, another big one for Russia. Uh, and China buys a lot more than anybody else there. Azerbaijan. Another big, big weapon buyer from Russia. Now, that's kind of funny because you would think Azerbaijan is close relationships as they have with Turkey. Why are they buying it from Russia and not from the United States? Maybe the deal is not so close to them after all. Who knows? Sudan, uh, of course, it begins to drop way down when you look at Sudan, Belarus, Kazakhstan, uh, Ukraine rebels, uh, Turkestan. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, right on down. And Russia, when it comes down to people like uh, the Ukrainian rebels, they don't have really a whole lot to be able to pay for their weapons. So I'm sure a lot of that's just given to them. There is a strategic reason for Russia in that area there. Um, but anyway, it, it's just strange, very, very strange. Uh, and of course, both the United States and Russia import weapons. Uh, from, from different countries as well as, as the article goes on. Let's, let's get down, let's get ready to... We're going to wind down our broadcast now. Let's go back to Matthew 24, though, verse 6 again. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. But we already know we're nearing that end now. Why? Because of verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. We're seeing this already. And there shall be famines and pestilence. And by the way, famines... Uh, and pestilence, and earthquakes, and diverse places, I don't think necessarily has anything to do with the wars. They happen. Maybe they do. Maybe there is some correlation because it is worded together, and there shall be famines, and pestilence, and earthquakes, and diverse places. It almost looks like he says about the wars and rumors of wars, and then Yeshua says about the nation rises against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Then he says, and there shall be famines, and pestilence, and earthquakes, and diverse places. That, that is interesting in itself. That even, and I don't say this is where the two witnesses come in, but it does remind me of that. We do know Yeshua clearly speaks of the two witnesses in Matthew 24 when he says, this gospel will be preached unto all the world, then the end shall come. That's when you know you're in your last days. And that's another reason why, friends, that for those of you that may wonder, you know, when I say that I believe that after the death of the two witnesses, it's pretty much over. Because Jesus clearly says, Clearly, he said it, when this gospel is preached unto all the world, then the end shall come. The way Jesus preached it is not preached by churches today. Now, I'm not saying that they don't have, you know, a good, they have the solid, basic fundamentals of salvation. Yes, I believe that the, the church, the, the, I don't want to even say churches. I'm not big on the churches, guys. I'm going to tell you, just, I'm, I'm just not. But when it comes to individual believers, let me say it like that. I know there's a lot of believers that love the Lord, Yeshua. They believe Jesus with all their hearts. You know, they're filled with the Spirit of God. And they, they stand for it. Salvation, all these things. Water baptism, right on spot, right on the money. You know, that's not what I'm talking about. But as a whole, the church itself has failed at bringing the true gospel of Jesus Christ without being corrupted, without putting a doctrinal twist to it, without bringing in some kind of ism to go with it. Now, it's not to say that, that, it, that, it, uh, you know, that it's, some, it's a major thing, but see, Jesus wants that pure word to come out. So he said, when this gospel is preached into all the world, then the end will come. That's what brings the end, the two witnesses. And I believe they're the ones that bring this gospel to the world. 
That's what I'm looking for is to be that final note there. Anyway, as I mentioned to you earlier, the stabbing attack uh, photograph here of the scene there from Israel National News there that happened today, the man that was lightly wounded. Another disturbing news that came out of Israel two days ago that I, I happened to miss, terrorist suspect nabbed with police uniforms. Now, that's not the suspect there. Uh, that's an actual Israeli police officer there in, in uh, uniform there. But they had actually... Uh, a, a, They'd gotten a tip off by, uh, luckily, by a man that lives there in, uh, in the, on the other side there, I forget exactly where, near Bethlehem. Uh, they'd gotten a tip that there was a man that was trying to come to the border that, had been, that had, was smuggling police uniforms. And they believe that the, the man that was doing this, this was reported on Israel National News today, the 36-year-old terrorist suspect was planning to, use, to do an attack dressed in uniform to be able to make his attack even easier. If you're visiting Israel, let me remind you to be vigilant and be ready. In fact, it's good to be vigilant and ready every day. We never know when our time is to go. Never know when he may, as they say in the old saying goes, he pulls your number and it's your time to go. So I do encourage you, if you do not know Yeshua, HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ is your own Savior, I encourage you. Get on your knees and pray. Cry out to Him. He'll come visit with you personally and save your soul. I'm Stephen Benu with Israeli News Live. Shalom and good evening.